O Lord, the ones you teach from your law. The Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. Judgment will again be founded on righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow him. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Our second lesson comes from Galatians. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbors as yourselves. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I said, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, self-ambition, dissensions, fraction and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, those who like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Our third lesson comes from Colossians. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of his body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in the word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I begin work on this particular sermon from Romans chapter 8, I uh, realized rather early on that uh, there was no way that in my positive thinking I could get through verse 17. Because I decided uh, that this text is an excellent lesson in the Reformation doctrine of perseverance of the saints. And I want to spend some time thinking about that. Now, I was raised, I was raised in a church that preached eternal security. What is that? Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. How many believe that? I believe that. But the uh, Presbyterians and the uh, Reformation folks prefer the phrase perseverance of the saints to eternal, eternal security. 
What does perseverance of the saints mean? You have to persevere. Okay. You have to persevere. However, it does not disclaim eternal security. The teaching, I think, is that as Jesus prayed in the garden, I know that you will not let me lose one of these that have been given me. Jesus says, I won't lose a single person who comes to you through faith. Precious points. And I do believe once saved, always saved. I don't think God was back in his work. But I also believe in the perseverance of the saints. That there is a necessary progression in your Christian life. Not that guarantees your salvation, but is a living, walking, breathing proof text of the authenticity of your claim to be a saved. You can't be the same Christian you were five years ago, folks, and be a Christian. You can't. You're calling a good game, and you might have us all fooled. But perseverance of the saints says that God will finish the good work he began in you when you came to God through faith in Christ. So there is a, an observable progression in your, may I say it, Christ likeness. Now, that's sticky and tricky. I mean, it was one of the Reformation doctrines, one of the things they, 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 they tried to bring back into the church after 1,500 years. So it's worth our time to think about and to, and to get right. It is not salvation by works, not by any means. But it is critically important to our understanding of <coughs> who we are as Christians and what we're all about as Christians. Let me read. In Romans 6, remember, the Apostle Paul countered the concept of easy believism by explaining both why authentic Christians want not to sin and how they can avoid sinning. What is easy believism? I don't made that phrase up. It is, well, when I was six years old, I remember I went forward in church and I said some words after the preacher, and a week later I was baptized, and I was told I was going to heaven, and uh, I've been living my own life ever since then, and you might not like it, you might not approve of it, but you know what? I'm, it, the deal's in. I'm, I'm, I got it. I'm not bad at me. Uh, easy believism is Christian cruise control, which is chilling. Uh, it, had, it comes in all sizes and shapes. Fire but, insurance. Yeah. Fire insurance. The worst case of it is a Christian who doesn't know, he's, doesn't know he's doing it. Doesn't know that he's standing still in his Christian life. You can't do that for too long. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, the why. Why are other Christians want not to sin, Paul says in chapter 6? Well, because we've died to sin. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We have died to the power of sin over us. We have died to the fate that is that of all non-Christians who have to sin. We've been given in our salvation the power to choose not to sin. When we are tempted, we have the power, thanks to the Holy Spirit, to say no to the sinful choice, the more pleasant choice perhaps, the one we prefer perhaps, and to say yes to the choice that honors, honors Christ. How? The how of that equation. Paul writes in verse 11, chapter 6. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. I told you that you are dead to sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, consider yourselves to be that. What is the King James word? Reckon. Reckon yourselves dead to sin. Believe it. It's a fact. Believe it. You know, if I have a, a million dollars in a bank somewhere, and if I do, let me know, will you? If I have a million dollars in a bank somewhere in North Dakota, and I don't know it's there, what good does it do me? Well, it's in my name. Had I known that, I would have drawn on it. But, you know, I didn't know. Paul says, I'm telling you, you are dead to sin. Christ has 
rendered you dead to sin in the sense that it no longer can make you do what you don't want. Now, he says in verse 11, reckon yourselves to be that. That's knowing a fact and believing it to be true and then acting accordingly. That's reckoning, considering. Two, do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Oh, you're going to sin. I expect most of us have already sinned today once or twice. But Paul says, since you are effectively made dead to sin in Christ, don't let sin reign. If you've got a sin issue, a sin thing, it should not dominate you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is out there in the world, including all sin. So don't let sin reign. These things Paul is saying, he's saying to Christians who now have the power to not let to reckon. Three, do not present your members, your physical body's members, do not present your members as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, one of our favorite hymns around here is take my life and let it be, take my hands, take my feet, take my members, I present them to you. Now to his intended audience, and to many of us too, I think, Paul's explanation seems to suggest that life under God's grace sounds a wee bit like life under God's law. Doesn't all this considering, all this not letting, all this presenting and not presenting mean that if we are ever to attain the holy character God desires for us, we must obey some kind, some of the rules and regulations set forth in the law, or something like the law, maybe not so Jewish. I mean, uh, your own code of ethics. I was raised in a church where, I was, I've been told this many times, where I was told it was a sin to smoke cigarettes. My father, the finest fish man I ever knew, smoked cigarettes. And that set up a real conflict with me. I don't understand. I was told that the bishop of the rules, my mother in law told me that more than once. So I took her daughter out of base to the movies. And then later it was modified. Don't go to see R rated movies. And so on and so forth. We all have our own specific codes of ethics. But see, the point I'm trying to make here is. Nothing wrong with any of those rules. In Romans 7, the question is, in, in, the, uh, in, in point number two, is in order to be holy, don't I have to obey some rules? Isn't there a standard for holiness, like the Ten Commandments? Is there? What is holiness? It's set apartness. It is not perfection. But it is set apartness. It is otherness. You don't look like other people. You don't look like non Christians. You don't talk like them. You don't run in the same circles. You don't get your kicks out of the same things. Your minds are in different place. In order to be that, isn't there some kind of standard, like some kind of a checklist? I'd like for there to be, it'd make it easy. I get a check it. Weigh myself every morning, write that down, and then check my list off every morning. How, how I did yesterday, what I promised to do today. Isn't that the standard? In Romans 7, I write, Paul answers that question with an unequivocal no. Christians, not even Messianic Jewish Christians, are no longer under the dominion of the law or any other made up set of must not disciplines, no matter how sincere. Are well intentioned. Now I've, I've referenced Colossians 2 here. Read part of that to you. Verse 16, Colossians 2, Paul writes, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Don't let anybody run you down for what you allow yourself to do. Paul is saying. It's a pretty broad statement. It's a little scary too. These are a shadow of the things that are to come, 
The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, that's the head of the church, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle this. Do not taste that. Do not touch these. These rules, Paul writes, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. The, the short read of that is, any set of ethical rules, any step-by-step -step process, including the Ten Commandments, good and even holy unto themselves, can't save anybody. Can't they make me a better Christian, though? You might ask yourself, that's what I was told. Well, if you're seen in the line in the movie, waiting to get in, and one of your unsaved Christian friends drives by and sees you standing in line, you'll lose your testimony. That's my mother-in-law speaking. Every part, pardon me, part of every Christian spiritual DNA is the very real desire to please God. Don't you want to please God? I know you do. Surely then we must do something. I'd like to please God. Tell me what to do. Tell me what not to do. That's how we think. As a matter of fact, there is something God wants all of us to do. Four things, actually. Continual actions that will keep us plenty busy while we wonder what we should be doing. You know these. The first we call the great commandment. What's that? Yeah, and the second? Yeah. I mean, a scholar comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, tell us of all the commandments. He didn't just mean the ten. He meant the commandments and the law and the prophets and all the Mishnah and the Talmud, all the commentaries of all of those laws and rules, Jesus tells us, which one is the greatest? I want to start at the top. Jesus said, well, I'll tell you, and by the way, this was carried in the phylacteries of all the rabbis. It was rolled up in a scroll with a traditional lecture, right? Struck the forehead. You shall love the Lord thy God as one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind, with all your strength. That's a lot of love. That should be the determining factor in every direction you take every day, your love for God. Every choice you make, every word you say about someone, or, do something, or how you say it. And then Jesus added for their benefit, and the second greatest, if you need to know one, is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Just as much as you love yourself. Just as much care as you take getting your hair just right. Or picking out that outfit for Sunday morning or that pork meat. Just as much as you care about your body's health by working out and eating, and eating wisely and all that. You should love your neighbor in the same way. And then Jesus made this outrageous statement. On these two commandments hangs all of it. All those meticulous rules and specific instances that were added to the Decalogue to make it, you know, more understandable. All those hang on those two simple things. God wants you to do that all the time. That will keep you busy right there. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. The second, or the third thing God wants you to do, we call the law of Christ. Anyone know what that is? It's 
It's Galatians 6, 2. I'll read it for you. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens. When you drop by Farney Keedy and take the time to pick up Betty Gibson, you are carrying her burden. When you come to church early on Saturday morning and prepare a big meal for people you don't even know because your friend Lou Dubel passed away and his family wants to eat, you're carrying their burden. When you help your neighbor unload his truck without being asked to be carrying his burden. When someone wants to come to this meeting but they kind of got a conflict, how can I help? Can I babysit? You're carrying that person's burden. Paul, Paul said, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill what? The law of Christ. Which Jesus gave to the disciples at the Last Supper. A new command I give to you what? That you love one another. Not just like one another. When Jesus said, love one another, he said love in the most active sense of that term. You're moved with compassion to every need they express. You are so slow to judge those people and so quick to love them and help them. That's my new command. That's my last word to you, Jesus said. So we have... Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have loving our neighbor as ourselves. And of course, that's the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, your neighbor might be your worst enemy. I had a neighbor once who was just hateful, just awful, just not a good neighbor. And I was always pierced by that neighbor. Love that neighbor just as much as you loved yourself. Don't just put up with them. Baby them and take care of them. Take care of yourself. That's a tall order. And of course, that all bleeds into the most outrageous commandment of all for all of us to take note of and practice as love your enemies. That thing about loving your enemies, which is the hardest lesson Christians took for us to learn. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor. And hate your enemy. Well, Jesus never said that, and the Bible doesn't say that. But the Mishnah had begun to say that. I tell you, Jesus said, love your enemies. See, that's crazy talk. Because we know what Jesus means when he says love. He does not mean to put up with your enemies and accept them for what they are. Let their bad words roll off your back like water off a duck's. No, Jesus said, I want to love your enemies. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. Not just that they stop, but that God blesses them. Not that God aids them in their persecution, but that God speaks to them. And maybe God can use you in this persecution set up to get through to them. This is very grown up Christianity. And the person who the saints walks through that. Pray for those that persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? When Paul used the word tax collector, he said it was gritted teeth. The most aided social class in Israel. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. When you read these verses, you begin to understand what otherness is like. It's unlike what we see. Paul's language confession followed by his triumphant declaration of affirming faith which closed chapter 7 is the perfect segue for this morning's chapter 8 beginning. 
In Romans 7, verses 13 to 23, Paul agonized over the fact that even he, a famously righteous former Pharisee, even he, the Apostle Paul, cannot please God through his own best efforts. Not even his most sincere and devout want to. I so want to please God. In verses 24 and 25, Paul reminds himself and us, his readers, that anything, listen, anything you could do to find favor with God has already been done by Christ on the cross. You can't make yourself any better in God's sight. Oh, you can improve yourself. You can be a better Christian for sure. But I've said this many times. God looks at a child of his who came to him through faith in Jesus Christ. He sees not your warts and your wrinkles. He sees the sinless perfection of his son all over you. And the process of the Christian life is making, what's the old straight dog lovers know this one? I hope to be someday as good a person as my dog thinks I am. Amen. We are moving toward being standing, being what we are, what we are to be, really being what God has called us to be and what He sees us as. That's sanctification. And that requires perseverance. It requires sticking to it and working at it. You can't get more saved. You won't get a better mansion in heaven. But you'll be blessing God. And blessing others and blessing yourself in the process of this movement. So now that I've done the two-hour introduction, I'll begin preaching. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this lesson we're about to embark upon about the Christian life, the nuts and bolts version. Thank you, Lord, for your desire that we revel in our new life in Christ. That it not be a labor or a burden, but a joyous expression of life lived to its fullest. The abundant life that Jesus promised us. So Father, we're eager to learn how to stop living such ordinary lives. Such drab, ordinary, circumstantial oriented lives. To live above the fray, to your glory, and to our blessing. So guide us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to Romans 8. And Romans 8 is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. As I say in the sermon notes, Romans 8 1 is one of the best therefores in all the Bible. Having said all Paul said in Romans chapter 6, having said all Paul said about his own struggles to try to please God in his own strength, I know what I want to do, but I can't do it. I know what I don't want to do, and I always wind up doing it. Oh, what a wretched man I am, Paul writes. And then he remembers again and again, wait a second, I need not despair. That victory has been won. Oh, I'm still fighting a few skirmishes here and there. But the victory has been won by Christ. Victory in Jesus. And verse 8 is perfect, of course, it knows really chapter verse to break up some original text. But the next word Paul says, therefore, because of that, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that is mighty good news. Amen. There is no condemnation. God is not going to condemn you no matter how off the track your life is right now. How to control your thoughts are right now. How mean your thinking runs these days. God will not condemn. There's no condemnation. That was all paid for by Christ. What? Who's that for? See, there are people out there in churches that say, Paul means everybody. Because they believe in the doctrine of universalism. Christ died for everybody. And that's a pleasant thought, I must say. But the Bible can't support us. And we talked this morning about the Bible as a final authority. For those who are in Christ Jesus. By the way, uh, where does your verse 1 end? 
Somebody stand and read your Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Yeah. New King James. Yeah, those last 13 words are not of the oldest, best manuscripts, and new Bibles won't have them. And those same words do show up in verse 4, though, the exact same words. Those who walk not according to the flesh, but the Spirit. But uh, somewhere along the line, somebody tacked it on to verse 1, and, and they found out that the oldest manuscripts don't have that tacked on to verse 1. Period, isn't it? See, my verse 1 in, ends with, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. Or come. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? That's a good one. And if I hadn't gone to Grace College and said a New Testament survey class, <laughs> if I hadn't uh, been able to use the brilliant scholarship of all the commentators I reference, I would not have known that that little preposition in is a reasonable rendering of two Greek prepositions. One is you don't tell you this. One is E I S. Ice. When you say someone is in ice, Christ Jesus, you are saying in so many words that person is actually has been actually brought into Christ Jesus from another place. Paul uses here ice, the Greek preposition best translated as into, as in the sense of a person being moved from one place or situation to another and brought into entirely new surroundings or into a completely different set of circumstances. The promise of no condemnation is given exclusively to those who are in Christ. Not to those who merely accept and admire the historical Jesus, named Jesus, the historical person named Jesus, and appreciate his teachings. There's a difference. If you are, if you've been brought from where you were and placed into Christ by the Holy Spirit, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you're brought into a vital union, vital living, breathing union with Jesus Christ, you are in Christ. That promise is for you. There's no condemnation. So I want to send them pews. They're not in Christ. I don't mean they've gotten off the, the narrow way. I mean they've never actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brought them in the union of Jesus Christ. Now I'm talking about I'm talking about a second blessing. I'm talking about the reality of the Spirit ratifying, certifying your relationship to God through Christ. It isn't just something you said. When you came to God through faith in Jesus Christ, whether you were a little boy like I was, went forward and heard what the preacher had to say, and I nodded my head to everything. Or if you were an adult who had lived this life and came to Christ later in life and understood that you needed a Savior. If that was something that God administered, a spiritual transformation has been. It isn't your baptism certificate that makes you different. It isn't your stated confession, your testimony that makes you different. It is the fact that you are being transformed from the inside out. That's the deal. And so the Spirit begins to work in you from the get-go to make you now wonder about some of the things you used to prove automatically. Or makes you Think more about spiritual things than you ever did before. Make you less tempted by this or less attracted to that and more attracted to this. And more desirous of that. It makes me want to love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind and all my strength. The Spirit in me has brought me into Christ. Understand? So, the perseverance of the saints begins with this. When God calls someone, 
when God brings you into his kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ, you are, as Paul said famously, a new creature. You are not the same person you were before you realize God has called you. And it begins to show up, folks. Once a person has faith that moves into Christ, R.C. Sproul writes, then is he or she securely in Christ Jesus, having what we would call a mystical union with Jesus Christ. Faith moves me from outside of Christ to inside of Christ, from outside God's kingdom to inside God's kingdom. So anyone who is in, E-I-S, eyes, who is in Christ will never, ever be condemned by God. And Paul goes on in verse 2 to write these, these words. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life sets you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, what he's talking about? He's talking about the law that he lived by all those years before he came to Christ. He's talking about the Sinai law. What? He would call it the law of sin and death? John Stott writes, shocking as it may sound, God's holy law could properly be called the law of sin and death because it occasioned both. Paul taught us in chapter 6 that once sin became codified in the law, people were drawn to it. He had to say, say to himself, now the law was not, the law was holy. My response to it was totally unholy. Any set of rules and regulations can become that. They can become laws of sin and death. I, I, was, I was told many years ago that the main issue with made-up rules and regulations, I'm not saying it's evil, is they make you proud. Good Christians don't smoke. I don't smoke. You do smoke. Therefore, I'm a better Christian. That's how it goes. We are set free from the law of sin and death. We are set free by the law of the Spirit that gives life. There is no reason why Christians should go on in a life of penal servitude, bound to carry out the dictates of the tyrannical law of sin and death. Christ dwells in them by His Spirit, and His Spirit infuses them into a new principle, the law of life, which is stronger than indwelling sin and sets them free from its Tyranny. And Paul tells us in verse 3 that the law has a limit and it can't save you. It was never intended to save anybody. It was intended to lead everybody to Jesus Christ, the Savior. The law tells us clearly that you can't be good. You can't be as good as God. If this is God's righteous standard, no one can meet it. So built into the law was the annual sacrifice for the sins that everyone knew you could commit. All the failures to obey the law perfectly. Jesus came along in God's economy, the Son of God, fully man, as well as fully God, the only human ever to live the perfect life without ever breaking a single jot or tittle of the law. Therefore, when he came to be offered as a sacrifice, he was completely unblemished. And in God's economy, the invitation was open. Anyone who wants to cast your sins on this perfect sacrifice do so. And so that's what you did when you came. You accepted Christ's perfect sacrifice as your own, as your atonement. And it wasn't just something that whew, clears the deck so you don't go to hell. It's something that is designed in God's plan to begin to change you, to be more and more like Christ, and less and less like the other guy who were before you came to Christ. That's the trick. So I'm going to ask you a question I want you to answer, but are you more Christ-like this morning than you were, say, 12 years ago? I hope you are. Wait, are you saying, Doug, that Christians can't, can't sin? Of course I'm not saying that. We'll get to this next week because I'm out of time. But Paul will talk about, we read this in the scriptures in Sunday school this morning. Uh, he, just, he divides the world into three kinds of people. Now, if you're an old King James or like I am, and a fundamentalist like I certainly was, 
those three, those three kinds of people that Paul divides the whole world into are the natural man and the sinful or the spiritual man, and the middle, the carnal man. The natural man, Paul writes, is the person who's never come to God through faith in Christ. He is natural on his own. He cannot please God. He doesn't even want to please God. He doesn't care at all about God. The spiritual man, part of the reference, spiritual woman for man is a person who has come to God through Jesus Christ, who now has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, who are now into Christ. And now their lives are radically changing. It might take a long time. It might be a slow process. But they're becoming more like Christ, more like Christ, <coughs> Christ like the In the middle, the King James translation for worldly was carnal. Because Paul keeps talking about sins of the flesh. And so why not use carnal for a world? Well, can anyone tell me what a carnal Christian is supposed to be? Come on! What's a carnal Christian? I know you guys have got the churches. Come on. What's a carnal Christian supposed to be? Be a worldly Christian. Yeah, that sounds good. If you like the word car carnal, John, fine. What's a worldly Christian supposed to be? What's he supposed to be? Well, you tell me what is it? When Paul says there are, there are these people who are spiritual, or natural or worldly. A, a worldly Christian is someone who is acts like the people in the world, but he's a Christian and he's got his feet, foot, feet in one foot in one place and other foot in the other place. Yeah. Thank you, John, for that explanation. Now, is that possible? Yeah. Is it possible to be a Christian and be worldly? Is it possible to be a Christian? And to be carnal, that is, all mixed up with the flesh. Wait, you're nodding your head or shaking your head or something. What's There's up? no such thing as a carnal Christian. What's that? There's no such thing as a carnal Christian. You <laughs> listen to R.C.'s problem. I differ with Wayne in that. Yes, we do. I believe you can be worldly for a while. It cannot go on. God won't let it go. A lot of people who call themselves Christians who are worldly, I'll call them carnal if you like. But a real Christian who goes off the beaten path, God will bring that person back. It might be a gentle nudge back toward the fold. It might be a jerk. It might knock you off your feet. It might shatter your world. He'll do that to get you back to so carnality, if there is such a thing, can't last long. Otherwise, listen, check your religious. You must not have the Holy Spirit driving you crazy. I can testify to this. A period of my life for lasted almost exactly one year. When I was, after preaching, after leading a youth group, after being a, a Christian singer in a band and writing songs and all these things, I lived a year of total rebellion. It drove me back to the fold. I could not have survived. Had I gone. Mind you, David in Psalm 51. Yep, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, the Holy Spirit will not let you be carnal if he does it all for very long. He will eat at you and drive you back to the feet of the cross. You are not bothered by sin reigning in your body. Check your credentials. Maybe nothing actually happened. Maybe you are not being transformed to a new creature. Maybe you need to make that decision today. Maybe you need to decide this is the sign. Yeah, I, want, I want that. I, I'm, I, I want to live a life that glorifies God and what it sounds like blesses me and blesses other people just by being around me. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And for parents and, and grandparents and even for spouses, there's no greater testimony than the fact that your loved one sees you as such a better person than you were five years ago. Wow. He used to be a jerk, she says. He's still kind of a jerk, but not so bad. Or maybe more dramatic. Ain't nothing wrong with Mary. I've heard that many times as a pastor. Never in a good way. So I'm counseling a couple who have trouble. 
He's not the man in right. What she means is, he's changed the ways that maybe think he was a fraud. I don't do counseling for people who say, he's not the man I married. He's much better. They don't need counseling. They get it. And that's what Paul is talking about. And this is all part of the conversation about perseverance of the saints, which we'll pursue again, Lord willing, next Sunday. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the work that you've begun in Christians. Thank you for your promise that you'll not let that work which you've begun to go unfinished. Thank you, Father, that we are able to actually see and manifest to others the changes that you are making in us. Our new creatureliness spilling out of our old creature. Father, that's our prayer. We know that if we've come to you through faith in Christ, our eternal futures are secure. We know that Lord. Father, we are really anxious to live lives that please you, that glorify you, that bless people just who are in the same room with us, that bless our own lives. This is a promise, Father, that not really enough of us take advantage of this, this growing in grace and truth, this perseverance of the saints. Thank you, Lord, for beginning that work. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thanks for the power that he gives us to understand your scriptures and to enable our wise choices, to give us the strength to say no when it's appropriate and yes when it's necessary. Continue, Father, to teach us as individual Christians and as a church how to be the best reflectors of your glory, the best possessors of the joy of your salvation. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close.